Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream. I want to first of all just thank you so much for tuning into our services here online and, and just thank you for being a part of our services in that way. But I would also like to just take a few moments this morning before we get started with our service to welcome you and invite you to come be a part of our in-person services here at Bellevue. We have so many different opportunities and ways that you can be involved with our church in person. Uh, on Sunday morning, that starts off with Sunday school at 930. We would love to get you plugged in one of our classes so that you can uh, grow together with other believers in the study of the word and also uh, just have a great time of fellowship there in Sunday school. And then again at 1045 here in the sanctuary at Bellevue Baptist, we have a uh, awesome worship service planned for you. And we would love for you to come be a part of it. We have great worship. We hear the word proclaimed and uh, we're able to just take part in what it is that God is doing here at this church. And so again, we would love to have you be a part of those services. Again, Sunday school at 930, worship service at 1045. And we look forward to seeing you at the next available opportunity. But until then, we hope you enjoy this stream and that you receive a blessing from the Lord through it. Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at Bellevue today. We are so glad to be able to celebrate Easter with you today and to declare that he is risen. This morning, we're going to begin our service by reading from Zephaniah 3, verses 14 through 20. To sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord." Bellevue family, it's so good to see you this morning. Will you please stand with us as we celebrate our risen King? Desperation 
people's here because the only time I'm ever looking back at you, but it's good to see you here this morning. We're glad that you're here. And if you're just visiting, we hope that you will come back. We do this every Sunday morning, so uh, uh, we'd welcome you to come and, and be with us anytime. Uh, I want to also uh, thank the church for we have exceeded our uh, Annie Armstrong goal for this year. Uh, you can still continue to give, but uh, it's good to reach, reach a goal when you set one, and we have reached that, so thank you for that. A few announcements for this coming uh, week. Uh, next Sunday, we will have a fundraiser. Uh, it'll be Taco Sunday next Sunday after worship service, and this money will go toward the mission trip in August, so remember that. That's $5 a person next week. And then also, on the uh, 6th of May, we will be taking part in the Mitchell Elementary School Field Day. And if you'd like to volunteer for that or donate uh, some items that we might need, some bottled water or cookies for that day, and that will be in the uh, ball field area, the track area right behind the school, and that will be on May the 6th. So remember that, and we'll be talking more about that as uh, time gets a little nearer. Also, another baby shower to announce, Amanda Cook, our own Amanda Cook, uh, will be uh, on May the 1st, so let's remember that. Uh, that'll be coming up also. And I think that's all the announcements that I have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll start our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this good turnout. We thank you, Lord, for the sunrise service. And Lord, we, we actually saw the sunrise. Uh, many of us were expecting rain, and uh, I guess we uh, prayed enough that you, you saw fit to see, give us some sunshine this morning, and we thank you for that. It was a beautiful service, something that we haven't done in a long time, and we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this crowd that is here today. We ask that you would be with this service. Everything that is said and done will be pleasing to you. We ask you to be with Brother Cole as he brings this message, Lord, to us today on this special day for all Christians, the day that we recognize that the tomb was empty. And, Lord, we know that you're alive. Thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand with us as we continue praising him for who he is? Joy. 
Stop. 
Well, amen. It is so good to be with you here on this Easter morning, and uh, I'm so glad that you have joined us for worship today. And we are going to be continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of John today. And so if you're with us uh, in your, in your uh, Bibles, will you go ahead and turn to John chapter 5, uh, verses 31 through 47. We're going to be in John chapter 5, verses 31 through 47. And as you're turning this morning, I wanted to uh, just share a quick story with you this morning. And it's the story of a British minister. His name was W.E. Sangster. And he was a very famous preacher and teacher. And uh, toward the end of his life, he began to lose his voice and uh, his mobility. And he had a disease that caused progressive muscular atrophy. And he recognized that the end was near. So he had to stop his preaching. And he threw himself into writing and praying because his voice eventually failed. Throughout that time, his legs also became useless, and just a few weeks before his death, it was Easter morning, he took a pen and he shakily wrote his daughter a letter, and in it he said this, he said, it is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, he is risen. He said, but it would be still more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. I'm thankful to God this morning to have the opportunity to stand here today and to say that he is risen. We are thankful for Christ's death and His resurrection. We're thankful for His grace in saving us. And wonderfully, we have the opportunity to cry out as witnesses today and every day to that great and tremendous miracle. We're witnesses to Christ's resurrection and His awesome saving power. And so today we're going to look at a sermon that I've titled, Unimpeachable Witnesses. So if you will, let's look at John 5, 31 through 47. You follow along in your translation. I'll be reading from the ESV. Verse 31, it says, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, we again come praising you for your grace and mercy to us. Lord, we thank you for the tremendous grace that you show us through the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us. And Lord, we come rejoicing this morning that the tomb is empty. Lord, that he is risen. We know that he's seated at your right hand, making intercession. And Lord, we come today asking you to bless this service, that it might be honoring and glorifying. Lord, that you would be pleased with it. Father, we pray that everything we do and say would bring you honor and glory. Lord, we pray that you would speak to your people today. Lord, you'd move me out of the way and use me as a mouthpiece to proclaim your message. Father, we truly want to hear from you that we might know how to live lives that would be more pleasing And Lord, more fruitful. So Father, today equip us for the task ahead of us. Lord, encourage us for the dark days that we may face. And Lord, convict us that again, we might be more pleasing to you. It is in Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, again, this is a continuation of our series in the Gospel of John, and so if you're joining us for the first time this year, uh, today this will be uh, in kind of newer material to you, so I, I just want to catch you up, remind you where we are, and uh, give you a little background so that you can understand what we're talking about today. 
At this point, um, Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist acknowledged him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. At this point, Jesus has called his disciples. He's turned water into wine. And he has taught the Jewish teacher, Nicodemus, on what it means to be truly born again. He's engaged with the Samaritan woman at the well. He's talked about what it means to have living water. Then we saw that Jesus has healed a nobleman's son. And then just recently, we have seen that Jesus healed a man who had been invalid for over 30 years. And from that account, we are taught not to put our hope in superstition or trying to earn salvation on our own by being good enough. Neither one will help. Only putting our hope in the risen Christ will save us. Well, the Pharisees did not appreciate Jesus healing the man specifically on the Sabbath. They wanted Jesus to conform to their tradition instead of fulfilling the Father's sovereign will. And so Jesus began to teach them. And last week we saw that Jesus taught them specifically about his relationship with the Father. He taught them that salvation is about resurrecting the spiritually dead sinner and calling them to life. And we saw that he is not only the Savior, but he is also a judge. And therefore, our only hope is, again, to trust in him. Today, we find Jesus finishing his response to those Pharisees, and he's teaching today about his witness. But first of all, I want you to understand that when Jesus says, if I bear witness about myself, my witness is not true, when he makes that statement, he's quoting their rules back to them. Jesus is not saying that his word is not enough. Right? He's not saying that just because he's saying something about himself that it's not true, but rather he, he's again quoting their words back to them, their rules. The system that they were in required multiple witnesses. And so they said, you're saying you're the Messiah and, and that's not enough. We need to see some evidence and some proof. And Again, if you just look at the, the background that I shared with you of the context at this point, it would seem that Jesus has done a pretty good job of showing them who he is. But still, Jesus provides some evidence as to the truthfulness of his claims, and he provides a rebuke. And so essentially what we'll see today is that Jesus condemns them for not believing in light of all the evidence, specifically the people and the things that bear witness to him as Lord. And so today we will see that Jesus points out these unimpeachable witnesses. These witnesses are not lying, they cannot be made to contradict, but they all point to Jesus as being the Messiah and the Son of God. And so what I want to do is show you three unimpeachable witnesses that Jesus presents to us and then just a matter of application. So first of all, I want you to see the witness of John the Baptist. Jesus begins here, and again, he, he made that statement about bearing witness, and he says, there's another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Then in verse 33, he says, you sent to John. Now, obviously, we know that, that John here is John the Baptist. This is referring back to that encounter uh, where the Pharisees uh, sent agents to John and they questioned him and they wanted to know what was going on. And in that process, he testified to the truth. That encounter is found in John 1, 29 through 34, which I'll read to you. It says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist here, multiple times he uses that statement, I've borne witness, or it says that he bears witness. The Pharisees again had sent this group of people to find out just who John the Baptist was, and John the Baptist's statement was, I am not the Christ. But his testimony to who Jesus was, and it's the testimony that Jesus says is true, is that John the Baptist said that Christ was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he was the Son of God. This is the truth, Jesus says. John the Baptist, he, his whole point and purpose was in trying to prepare people for what was going to happen with Jesus. When he would cry out, make straight the way of the Lord. When he would call people to repent. But Jesus does not need to only rely on this. Uh, he's making a case based on the rules of the Pharisees, but Jesus is building though. He says, look, even John the Baptist got it, but I don't even need man's words at all. He says, I do this for your sake that you might hear his testimony and be saved. 
And then Jesus makes a a comparison that maybe is a little strange to us. He talks about John the Baptist again serving to point the way to him, but he, he says that John the Baptist was a lamp burning and shining. And in that, we can recognize that what Christ is saying is that he was lighting up the way to Christ. He was not the light, but he shined the way to Christ who is the light. And the people were fine with that for a time. They rejoiced in it. John the Baptist's ministry was exciting. All the people were flocking to him. Remember, he had to move locations because there were so many people coming to his ministry. Especially when he told them of the coming Messiah. But then, the calls for repentance... John the Baptist calling people out on sin, and ultimately his murder at the hands of Herod Antipas led to people leaving. John the Baptist shined the way, and they were content for a time in the light, but ultimately, as Jesus told Nicodemus, men love darkness more than the light. So even as great as John the Baptist's testimony is, Jesus presents another one. Secondly, this morning, I want you to see the witness of the works of Jesus. It says, the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. You see this here in verse 36. The works that the Father has given him to accomplish, the things that he was doing, they testify that the Father has sent him. And we think about the miracles Just, you know, flip through the Gospels in your Bible and look at the headings and you can see some great ones. The water turned to wine, the healings, the exorcisms, the feedings, the raising of Lazarus, and even his death and resurrection. These are amazing works. And every one of them testifies to the fact that Jesus is Lord. I mean, we begin to think about these things. If that kind of stuff was going on around here, we would be pretty excited about it. At least people would be talking. And the Pharisees themselves, they understood this. Uh, Back in in John 3, verse 2, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, it tells us this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus understood it. He saw enough to know that God had sent him and that God had to be at least with him to do the things that he did because this is not normal. This is not business as usual. Things are different with him. The people saw this as well. John 7.31 says, Yet many of the people believed in him and they said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The idea behind their statement was that there was no way that anyone could expect any more signs from the Messiah than what Jesus was doing. How could we expect more? This man has done so much. What more could the Messiah do than what he is doing? And again, the Pharisees themselves, again in John 11, 47, says, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. They understood. And this testimony, according to Jesus, condemned them. In John 15, 24, he says, If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. They had seen them. The interesting thing about Jesus' miracles is that they are always seen by multitudes of witnesses. They're always externally attested. Meaning that other sources outside the Bible even confirm that Jesus performed many miracles. They saw these things, though, and yet they have hated. It's so amazing that we can witness the miracle of Christ and what he has done and yet hate him. That's the very testimony that Jesus had about those people. But the best miracle is, is the resurrection. We cannot explain that away. It's the ultimate testimony that he is the Son of God. It's why we're here. Jesus defeated and controls death. His miracles constantly reveal they constantly reveal Jesus' divinity and his sovereignty, that he is God. 
When Jesus calms the storm or changes water into wine, he demonstrates that he's sovereign over the elements. When he casts out demons, he shows that he is sovereign over evil. In every one of those exorcism accounts, what we see is that the demons are terrified. They call him son of the most high God. When he heals people, when he raises Lazarus, and when he himself is resurrected, he shows his sovereignty over death and life itself. And when he dies on the cross for us, he shows his sovereignty in providing the way to salvation. His works show us that he is the Son of God. And so we are presented with this dilemma when we look at Jesus' works. We can either see them, works that no one else has been able to do or replicate. We can either acknowledge that witness or we can continue to hate him as the Pharisees did. Thirdly, this morning, I want you to see the witness of the Word of God. Verse 37 until the end. It says, The Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. Jesus makes a stunning accusation against them. He says, His voice you have never heard, His form you have never seen, and you do not have His Word abiding in you. Man. These were supposed to be the teachers of Israel, the people who knew the most. Yet they had never heard the Father's voice. They never had His word abiding in them. And the indictment is that they do not believe the one whom He has sent. There's another who testifies. It is the Father who sent Him, and it te- He testifies about Him. He says, if they, if they understood this, if they had the word in him, they would believe. And, and what's so amazing here is at the end of this section, he calls in what should be their greatest witness, right? They love Moses. Instead, Jesus references Moses himself. He says the same thing. Moses wrote about him. The very one who they claim to, to believe, again, as the father of, their, um, of the law, the one who gave that to them, yet now what Jesus says is that he wrote about Christ. And Moses, the one who they saw as their advocate, the one who saw as their leader, the one who led them out of Egypt, he is the very one who accuses them to the Father. Even the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, is speaking about Christ. It is the scriptures that testify to God. And so what we see here is that Jesus says the Pharisees, they've not heard God's voice and they don't have the word in them because if they did, they would believe. So what Jesus is saying here is that God testifies about Jesus both verbally and in the written word. We've seen it verbally in several places in Scripture. Uh, Most notably at his baptism in Matthew 3, 17, it says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. God the Father, a voice from heaven, says, This is my Son. He says it again at the transfiguration. Matthew 17, verse 5 says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. In both places, God speaks and He says, This is my Son. He's verbally testifying, this is who Jesus is. But we also see it in the written word as well. It's the same way. The Old Testament is what Jesus is specifically telling them though, and the disciples certainly saw this when they were called. When Jesus is saying here that they they, they don't have the word abiding in them and that they search the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. That was the scriptures that they had at this time. But consider how the disciples understood the Old Testament. When Jesus called them in John 1, verse 45, it says that Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They recognized that this was who the Old Testament was talking about. And Jesus would ultimately break this down for his disciples during the Passion Week. In Luke 24, 27, it says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. 
the Scriptures and God Himself speak clearly about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. We cannot read passages like Isaiah 53. We can't read these Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and not see that Jesus is the fulfillment of them all. And so what we see here is that Jesus again has built this amazing case. John the Baptist. His own works. The Word of God. They testify that Jesus again is the Son of God. In our Lord. And so what does this mean for us? Again, ultimately, we recognize the point here in this conversation was that he was teaching the Pharisees. He was, he was charging them and condemning them. But ultimately, what I want you to realize is that all of this witness shows us one thing. That Jesus is the Son of God. That He is our Lord. And that we have no excuse. Moses and the law condemn us, just as they did the Pharisees. The law that God gave, and He says that we are to be holy, for He is holy. When He handed down those commandments, and we couldn't keep the law and the commandments. We couldn't keep three of the Ten Commandments, or one of the Ten Commandments. We break them. In the New Testament, though, says that we're all without excuse. In Romans 1 verse 20, he says his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. All people are without excuse because all things testify to God's character and to who he is. And we are called to testify along with that as his creation. Our actions, our words, our thoughts, everything that we do is to testify that God is holy. That He's good. That He's gracious. That He is Lord. And so what we realize is that whenever we sin, we're bearing false testimony to God's character and His holiness and His glory. When we sin, we are not the witness. We are not the testimony that He has called us to be. And so we are guilty. We are accused. The law has made it clear. We cannot deny these witnesses. We can choose to bury our heads in the sand and we can try to deny it, but ultimately we are either committing perjury or we are lying to ourselves or we are testifying along with God and scriptures and everything else that Jesus is Lord. And so ultimately we are either a witness or a liar. So we must be clear. As believers, we are called to testify to the world as witnesses that Jesus is Lord. This was his command. In Acts 1.8, he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Witnesses share what they know to be true based on Sight and experience. I remember when Rosalind was in law school, I would frequently play a witness in some of the mock trials and trial competitions that they had. And uh, it was fun, but I was not great at it because I didn't actually know anything. (laughs) They gave me a piece of paper a few minutes before going in there, and so I didn't actually know what to say because nothing actually happened to me, and I didn't really know the situations, right? They were all made up. It was some piece of paper that I was supposed to memorize, and I was just kind of regurgitating this information back out. And so I was never effective as a witness because it was not a true, real experience. And I didn't really know that knowledge. I was just regurgitating something. The same was true of the Pharisees. They knew the Scriptures. They searched them, the Scripture tells us. Jesus says they searched the Scriptures thinking that they could find a way on their own. Jesus is not condemning Bible study when he's condemning them for searching the Scriptures. He's saying... The problem is that you're searching these scriptures looking to find a way on your own. 
to puff yourself up, to make you think that you're so great and that you can do it on your own. When in reality, Jesus said they didn't really have the word in their heart because it points to him. And the problem was that they were seeking their own glory over the glory of God and their sin blinded them. Again, we're all called to give all of the glory to him. And Jesus says you receive everyone else at face value because you seek the approval of man. And yet, with all this evidence, they refuse to glorify God. He says somebody can walk in here and tell you anything and you accept them because you just want people to like you. And you want glory. But yet, when you're presented with all of these witnesses and all of these things that I've done and, and what God has said... You don't believe it. So they who were supposed to be teachers, who were supposed to know the scriptures as well as anyone, missed the point entirely because they were so consumed with their own glory and themselves and how great they were instead of glorifying God. We are not here today to testify about ourselves. We are here to testify about who God is and who Christ is and what he has done. A witness is only as good at relaying the truth as they have experienced and seen truth. We cannot be effective witnesses for Christ without knowledge of the resurrection and without the Holy Spirit within us giving us power. We can't be effective witnesses for Christ if we have never truly experienced His grace and seen His working in our life. We'll just be regurgitating information that someone gave us. It is that knowledge of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to witness powerfully to His glory. Let me give you an example. Easter Sunday in 1973, the country of Uganda was just groaning under the terror of Idi Amin. There was a young pastor whose name was Kefa Sempangi. And in his mind, the thing that he could remember was the sight of soldiers cruelly beating a man. The horrible sound of boots crushing bones, all for the crime of being a Christian. But on Easter of 1973, this pastor bravely and openly preached on the risen Lord in his town's soccer stadium to over 7,000 people. After the service, five of the secret police followed him back to his church. They closed the door behind him. They all pointed their rifles at his face and they said, We're going to kill you for disobeying your orders from the dictator. If you have something to say, say it before you die. Sampanki is thinking of his beautiful wife, his lovely little girl, and he said he began to shake. But the risen Lord living in his heart gave him the courage to speak and he said, Do what you must. The word of God says that in Christ I am already dead and that my real life is hidden with him in God. It is not my life that is in danger, but yours. I am alive in the risen Lord, but you are still dead in your sins. May he spare you from eternal destruction. The leader of the secret police looked at Simpongi for a long time and then he lowered his gun and he said, Will you pray for us? He did. And those five secret police officers were converted through the witness of of his testimony. They became his friends and his protectors rather than his aggressor. It was Sampangi's knowledge of Christ that gave him the courage to speak such bold truth as a witness of Christ. You see, when we have experienced the hope of the resurrection, we no longer fear even death, knowing that Christ has saved us and that nothing outside God's will can happen to us. It was the same understanding of the gospel and the resurrection that led so many martyrs to stand firm and to stand strong. I encourage you to read their stories because in that you will see people who are truly convicted about what this means. For us, it's a, it's a great opportunity to get together and to wear pastel colors and take cute pictures and all these great things. But may we not forget that behind all of that is the resurrection that gives us the strength to stand, that gives us the hope to face tomorrow, that gives us the joy to, even when things are terrible, 
to praise Him. And may we bear witness to that with our life. Not just how great our weekend was, but how good He is. Listen, guys, the evidence is mounted and it's there. The verdict is in. Christ is Lord and we are guilty. The same witnesses that testify that He is Lord testify that we've fallen short of the glory of God. Think about it. John the Baptist's message was what? Repent. These miracles that Jesus performed, every one of them again shows us who he is and and how we are to submit to him as Lord of our life. And the word of God constantly shows us that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. Therefore, our only hope is to trust in him. Because the witness of all of Scripture is the same as that old catechism statement that Christ is our only hope in life and death. The only hope for us and the only hope for the nations is that of Christ. May we trust in Him and bear witness to all around us that Christ is risen. May that not simply be a statement we share a few times today, but may it be the testimony of our life. And give our life to bear witness to that. If you've not done it, then you too can experience new life today. Repent and believe in Him. If you're a believer today, then we are to be His witnesses. To glorify Him and to lead others to do the same. So let us testify to His glory, His goodness, His grace, and His power. And let us do it with resurrection joy. Let's go to Him in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we praise you for the fact that it tells us that Lord, you are a holy and loving and powerful God. And Lord, we thank you that it also tells us that we're sinners. Father, awaken us to that fact today. Help us to see that this testimony is true. Lord, we are sinful and we are in need of a living Savior. Lord, we are dead and in life. And so, Lord, we pray that again in this moment now that you would convict us, that you would make your will abundantly clear to us. Lord, that we might place our hope and faith in you alone and not in the things of this world. For we know that we do serve a risen Savior. And Lord, it is that which must again be our hope. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.